بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد I believe that Sheikh Muhammad Zalla Khair has spoken to you about istiqamah and you were all here inshallah is this true? so what's the definition of istiqamah? Yeah. <laughs> what was that? The what? Deep thing. Yeah, deep, 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 deep thinking probably, deep ideas. What, what is istiqamah? Steadfastness. To be steadfast on this religion. Now we're Muslims. Tomorrow we may change, right? Astaghfirullah. How do you say right? Is it a possibility? See, the most important thing is that you wake up after Isha. Because if you're asleep, you're going to tend to lose a lot of information. Is it possible that we change our religion tomorrow? No. no, because this is a religion that we believe is the core essence of our existence. Without Islam, we're animals. Without Islam, we're nobody. Islam gave us our dignity, our honor. Islam gives us our way of life. Islam makes us human beings that Allah Azza wa Jal love. And the more you drift away because of your sins, the more you become away from Allah and closer to being part of the animal kingdom. The Shaykh Zalla Khair definitely has spoken to you and we don't want to go into his beautiful talk, but istiqama is not a choice. It is an obligation. It is not something that you say, mm, today, I'm going to skip istiqama for a while. You know, it's New Year's Eve. I'm going to go and party and get wasted. Tomorrow I'm going to pray Fajr, inshallah. And what's done is done. It is not a choice. Because throughout your life, you're intimidated. You're frightened. Will I die now or later? And if I die now, would I be on the steadfast, on the straight path? And it goes without saying that the prophets alayhi salatu wasalam, used to ask Allah azza wa jal most what? The people are eating. What? What would he ask Allah most? Forgiveness. Do you have any hadith you remember? No. So, not forgiveness. Paradise. Not to go to hell? No. To keep the Ummah united. This is the most that he used to ask Allah Azza wa Jal. The hadith says that the Prophet والسلام, did not ask Allah anything more than to have his heart steadfast on the straight path. Ya Muqallib al Qulub. O Allah who turns hearts over, have my heart steadfast on your path. Aisha said, O Prophet of Allah, we have believed in you. We believe in you. So are you afraid? that we may go on our backs, back on our heels? He said, yes, the hearts are between two fingers of Allah, and he twists them, he turns them as he wishes. And that is why you wake up in the morning sometimes, you feel that I today will not conquer the world, I will guide the whole world. I have so much Iman in my heart. And sometimes you wake up in the morning and thinking, am I a hypocrite? This is what comes into your mind. Therefore, you have to ask Allah to have your heart steadfast on this religion. Otherwise, in a blink of an eye, you can change. You can shift. It is the guidance of Allah that keeps you on this path. Not your muscles, not your knowledge, not your friends. If you don't have Allah's guidance for you, with you, then you're lost. Okay, but the brother is asking, what's the interpretation of... The instruction of the Prophet ﷺ in the hadith of Ali ibn Abi Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, when he said, O Prophet of Allah, what about the over, all of a sudden look that I look at something haram, such as the opposite sex, for example, for, uh, at women? And he said, ﷺ, remove your gaze from it. And in another hadith, he told one of the companions, uh, asking him about looking at Women, he said, you have the first look. But the second look is 
against you. You'll be sinful for that. And lots of the brothers, as he mentioned, go down the street. There are lots of women who are not properly covered. So the brother will say, this is first look. This is first look. I'm not, I'm not going to blink. Don't blink. And he says that, first look, how, you need an hour for this first look, brother. What is meant from the hadith of the Prophet, ﷺ, the look is an arrow that comes and hits you in the heart. So if you look and you stare, this is second look. But if you, and it is not logical to drive and a woman crosses over and says, Astaghfirullah wa You're going to hit her. You have to watch the road. But if you start measurements, you know, 33, 34, 37, mm, how high, how, how short. Now this is haram, this is going to be registered against you. So the first look, what's meant by it is the look that is not followed by staring and by you know, m things that may cause you to desire. And in this, a person fears Allah. Because no one looks at you. No one knows if you're looking. If you pass by a billboard and there's a big woman not wearing anything. Or lapsam uh, al uh, in Arabic, we call her. So, and you look and nobody's watching. Nobody cares if you're watching or not. Allah registers. And this is what Allah says in Surah Ghafir. يَعْلَمُ خَائِنَةَ الْأَعْيُنْ وَمَا تُخْفِ الصُّدُورِ Allah knows the deception of our eyes when we look at something haram and what our chests hide. And Allah knows best. He's there to watch it. He's, he's bigger than me. So don't say anything bad. There are, as mentioned by the scholars, there are traps of shaitan. I don't know if the sheikh was talking about the traps of shaitan, which men was mentioned by Ibn al-Qayyim or not. Shaitan anticipates for you in traps or hurdles or uh, uh, obstacles he puts in your way. The first one is shirk. If he gets you here, alhamdulillah, khalas. To him, you've made his day. Shirk, kufr, uh, nifaq, uh, blasphemy, uh, uh, being an atheist, anything that nullifies Islam, he's happy with that. If you have Tawheed, then he takes you in the second obstacle or the second hurdle, which is Bid'ah, innovation. And if you have Sunnah in your heart, Tawheed and Sunnah, then this, these two are not good. So he takes you in the third and the fourth, which is major sins and minor sins. Major sins are all the sins that Allah Azza wa Jal warned and threatened those who commit them with hellfire or with prescribed punishment in this life. Stealing, chop his head, uh, hand uh, uh, off. Uh, killing, chop his head off. Uh, fornication, give him 100 lashes or stone him to death if he's married. Slandering, they give him 80 lashes, etc. Drinking, 40 to 80 lashes as well. So these are prescribed punishment. Or... Allah threatened those who do these major sins with cursing or with being away and uh, uh, departing from his mercy. Minor sins are all the sins that do not follow the previous criteria. So these are four. The fifth hurdle is the hurdle of disliked manners or, or, or issues known as makruhat, such, a, such as Drinking with your left. What's the ruling on drinking with the left? Some say it's makruh. The most authentic is it's haram. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ told us that do not drink with your left. Do not eat with your left. Do not give with your left. Do not take with your left. For the shaitan drinks and eats and gives and takes using his left. So the most authentic it is haram. But there are things that are disliked. And the definition of makruh or dislike are the things that if you do them, you're not sinful. But if you don't do them because you want Allah's uh, uh, reward, Allah will reward you. For example, entering the masjid with the, which foot? Right. right foot. But what happens if I enter it with the left foot? It's a sin? No. I have abandoned a sunnah and I'm not sinful, but I've lost the reward. Therefore, shaitan, if you have tawheed 
and if you're following the sunnah, and if you don't do major sins nor minor sins because of the, 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 the righteousness in your heart, he tries to catch you in the makruhat. So do anything that is not part of the sunnah, so you will lose the reward, but you will not gain sins. And, what, and, and the majority of Muslims think that this is okay, as long as I'm not gaining sins. Khalas, no problem. Not knowing that when you overdo it, and when you indulge yourself in doing makruhat, inevitably you're going to be upgraded to doing minor sins. And uh, uh, eventually you're going to do what's up and up and up. And this is what appears to me, and Allah knows best. And the Sheikh is there if he can uh, clarify this. And Allah Yes, brother. What did Dr. Zakir say? He never answered. Well, don't ask me. Why am asking me? <laughs> it's very simple, brother. We, and I believe that Dr. Nak uh, Zakir knows this more than I do, but maybe he was not given the time. The question was, a child asked Dr. Zakir when, as long as uh, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi our messenger, is the last messenger and last prophet, and he's the seal of the prophethood, what is the status of Maryam, uh, of Isa ibn Maryam when he descends to earth at the end of time? And he said that the, uh, Dr. Zakir did not answer. And the answer is very easy. He is still a messenger. But when the Prophet says that he is the seal of prophethood and, this, and he is the last messenger, meaning that he, no one will come with a new message. And that is why he told us that when Isa ibn Maryam descends to uh, uh, earth, he would rule only with the deen of Islam, of the Prophet Islam, and he would follow him. And he would break the cross, and he would kill the swine, and he will not take the jizya, as the Prophet said, Islam, but he will not bring any new message, no br new prayer, no new dhikr, or anything. He will comply with the deen of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa And that is why the Prophet was angry when he saw Musa, when he saw Umar, I'm mixing up things because it's already past my bedtime. Not because they did not offer us dinner. I'm quite full. Uh, this exactly happened with uh, Umar ibn Khattab when the Prophet once saw him, sallallahu alayhi wa reading a paper. And he said, Umar, what are you doing? And he said, oh, Prophet of Allah, this is a paper of the Torah, the book that was revealed on Musa, peace be upon him. The Prophet was outraged he was angry he took it off him and he said ibn al -Khattab, are you going to extreme uh, uh, Umar by Allah if Musa was alive he would not do anything except follow me why because he is the last prophet and the last messenger and his message is the final and his message dominates the other books and the other messages I hope this answers your question Yes, brother. First of all, I do not like to answer any question that deals with the Quran in the tafsir because the Quran is much nobler to give your own interpretation of it. And one is not advised to uh, uh, be hasty in thinking, yeah, I think it means this and that. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, said, what earth would carry me and what heavens would overshade me if I say in the book of Allah without knowledge therefore usually I refrain from usually I said from answering anything that deals with tafsir a verse of the Quran unless I am sure of it as for the uh, uh, verse you're referring to that in uh, uh, yeah. uh, the other one in Surah at taghabun that among your uh, wives and children uh, are enemies to you. This is in regard to those who were stopping the Muslims from migrating to Medina. They are enemies to you because they are stopping you from the way of Allah. And they are fitna because they tempt you to do things against the instructions of Allah. And the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, verily, your offspring, your son, is a cause of cowardness, a cause of being stingy and miserly, and a cause of 
uh, dismay and depression. Your offspring, your son. How can that be? Because when you have a son, you tend to take care of him more than anything else. So it would cause you, caring for the son, not to fight in the cause of Allah. It would cause you not to give in the cause of Allah in charity. And it would cause you to feel sad and depressed whenever he's late, whenever he's, he, he does not pass the exams or whenever he is ill. And this what appears to me on Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. The brother is asking why do some of the so-called Muslims say it is okay to go and steal money from the kuffar and abuse them and maybe beat them and maybe harm them and loot them. Why is, is it? And they say that this is in the Quran. Brother, whoever says this does not know how to wash himself after urinating, unfortunately. It, these are the ignorant people of Islam who have no knowledge. And they find it easy to justify their, their, their actions by blaming it on the Quran. Yeah, go and look on the Quran. Or someone would say, uh, the Prophet said in Sahih uh, al-Bukhari that it is okay to steal from the kafir uh, even if he's your neighbor because his money is halal for you. Rawahu al-Bukhari and Tirmidhi and uh, Ibn Majah, I think. And you go and look in the Bukhari and turn me there, Ibn Majah say, brother, it's not there. What would he say to you? <laughs> Maybe you're, wrong, you're reading the wrong translation. Look, look more, look more. <laughs> These are ignorant people. And I've met so many in this great country of yours, mashallah, uh, unfortunately, who make takfir, who make, if, if it was limited only to the non-Muslims, it would cascade down. I know brothers who think of other Muslims like they are kuffar. It's okay to take their money because they're living in the kafir country and they're approving of the kafir laws, then they're kuffar as well. So, Tabiq, what are you doing here? You're like him. Yeah, but I don't believe in their law. <laughs> Subhanallah. What do you do? I don't work. I'm taking uh, social security, um, <laughs> the benefits. Where do you live? In their buildings. And uh, your, your medical is NHS. May Allah bless them, NHS. They're kafir, but may Allah bless them. <laughs> Subhanallah, these are the most ignorant people on earth. They don't know Arabic. They don't know Quran. They don't know the Sunnah of the Prophet And they find it easy to shoot from the hip. They don't even take the gun. They just shoot from the hip and say, haram. Oh, halal. It's okay. <laughs> if, if, if you don't like it, sue me. What can you do? No, this is wrong. These people are ignorant. And that is why we say we have to surround the ulama, the scholars, those of knowledge, those who have traveled and studied, at least those who know Arabic. You, you can't have a scholar who does not know Arabic and does not know the Quran and does not know the usul al-fiqh, the fundamentals of fiqh, or the fiqh itself, or uh, the nasikh and mansukh, and, and all these great sciences of Islam. And then he comes and talks about saying that it's okay to jump over your neighbor's house and steal him? The Prophet had he ever done something like this? How did he deal with the kuffar? How did he deal with the kuffar? Huh? He what? Fought them. He fought those who fought him. But didn't he, ha he have Jew neighbors? The Prophet was invited once to uh, 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 a poisoned sheep from a Jew woman. Did he accept the invitation? Yes. yes. Did he say was it slaughtered in the Islamic way? Well, uh, he just went and ate from it. The Prophet visited a young Jew child who used to serve him. And he was ill. And when he went to him, he said, accept Islam. And the child looked at the Prophet and the, and the, uh, and the child looked at the, his father and his fa I'm not going to read this. I'm supposed to have someone to read this. And uh, the father said, Obey Abu Qasim. Obey the Prophet And subhanallah, the boy accepted Islam. This is how we're supposed to de deal with the non-Muslims. Not in a fashion that whenever I see a non-Muslim, I spit in his face. I kill you, you infidel. <laughs> I don't do this. We deal with them in the best Islamic fashion. I give them a big smile. Not because I like them, but because I like my religion. 
Now you are a public relation uh, a representative. Whatever you do, it's not going to be labeled as Muhammad or Abdullah or Asim or Mu'taz. It's going to be labeled on Islam. So whatever we do, they're going to claim that this is Islam. They're going to blame my religion. That's why I refrain from doing anything that may harm my religion. Allah knows best. Well, if you're watching ladies football, this is haram. <laughs> because you're not allowed to look at women. And we're talking about the first gaze. This is the first half and the second half. <laughs> so, no, this is definitely out of the question completely. And I don't want anyone to yeah, they say, oh, Sheikh, but it's the national team. It's again haram. It's not. No. Now, looking men to men, men watching uh, uh, matches between Manchester United and Arsenal, for example. What's the ruling on that? It's an issue of dispute among scholars. Why? Because of the definition of awrah. What is the restricted area in a man's body where I cannot look at? So the majority of scholars say that the thighs are not considered to be part of the awrah. But there is a hadith or two where the Prophet said والسلام, to one of his companions, cover your thigh for the thigh is a awrah. You're not allowed to show this. You're not allowed to expose this. And in another hadith, which is not authentic, but the scholars usually use it, that do not look at the thigh of a living person nor a dead person. So it's an issue of dispute among scholars. I personally believe that the thigh is aura, but nowadays a lot of the football players wear sort of stretches that reaches the knee. So it, in a sense, under the shorts, they have, uh, uh, I don't know what you call it. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, uh, that's something that uh, sticks to your skin and, and, and this covers the aura in a sense. So by this sense, it's okay to watch. However, what do you benefit from watching? Now look at the steps of shaitan that he's using. First of all, you're going to watch the, 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 the match. Uh, one, two, three, four matches and afterwards, you're going to be yani, uh, tempted to go and watch it live in the stadium with all the hooligans, with all the hee-haw, hee-haw. And preferably, maybe later on, Go for a pint of lager, for a couple of Guinness. Uh, I think they, I was not supposed to say this in them. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, get drunk and go with them. So you will find yourself going in the mainstream of those kuffar. Is this what, uh, why Allah created me? No, Allah created you to worship him. If you like football, go and play. Go with your brothers. I'm not doing this. Go with your brothers and dedicate, for example, one or two hours a week to play football. It's healthy for you, it's recreational, it's entertainment. But sitting on your backside, with all due respect, watching a game that lasts for an hour and a half to two hours, this only increases your backside size, <laughs> unfortunately. Because you're not, go you're not burning any calories, you're not... And all what you do is shouting and goal, and then what? Subhanallah, and then you end up fighting with your brother because he uh, uh, goes with uh, Fulham Club and, and, and the other one goes with Aston Villa or whatever. Well, why is this? We're having a drift between the Muslims because of football match and I personally don't watch it and I don't recommend anybody to watch it. I recommend that you play sports. I'm a sportsman, I play sports every day almost. And I encourage it because it gives you health, it gives you insp uh, inspiration, it uh, uh, re removes the stress in you. Uh, and Allah knows best. Well, uh, the question is misleading. Now, he's already married and he wants his woman to be pious and she's refusing. One of the, ma the main principles, take another wife. She would immediately, mashallah, become pious. No, seriously, if this is the first uh, wife and you have not got married yet, you have to be very selective. But if you're already uh, married and now you would like to uh, encourage your wife to be pious and practicing, this is a long process. And you have to first of all start with yourself. So if you 
are not practicing, if you are doing all the haram things that you enjoy, but you want her to cover and to sit home and not to do anything, this is to her unfair. She will never obey you and she would never listen to you. Oh, uh, plus, to adding to that, you have to try your best to increase the knowledge of your wife after you get this knowledge. You have to increase her awareness of Allah. So many times we fail when we instruct our loved ones, our children, our daughters and sons, our wives to pray by do's and don'ts. Do this, don't do that. And this is what Islam is limited in. And this is wrong. Instead of doing this, you have to teach your children, your loved ones to love Allah. So that when you want them to pray, this comes from within, not because you're watching. We fail to uh, 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 plant this fear of Allah, knowledge of Allah. If you get a, an A4 paper and I give it to not the children, but the grown-ups, write to me what you know about Allah. Probably you would write three lines and say, I'm, I ran out of gas. I, I don't know. Or to write to me what you know about Surah Al-Fatiha. Write to me about what you have seen from Allah's kindness. You never think of this. You take it for granted because your father told you pray. Your father told you do this. No, you have to know Allah if you have love for Allah. And you have to have love for Allah. You have to love Him. Once you love Him, you start to taste everything else in your mouth. You start to taste prayer when you pray. When I pray, I find, oh, mashallah, I'm enjoying my prayer. When I fast, I'm enjoying my fasting. I'm not tasting anything. I'm fasting. But I'm enjoying it. I find the taste of the beauty of fasting. And so on. Therefore, I believe that you have to work really hard on your wife if you want her to become pious and practicing by you, first of all, giving her the role model and, and be the example for her. And Allah knows best. This is a topic that I've lectured about three, four days, five days, six days, I don't, I don't recall, somewhere here in this country. Actually, actually it was in Chennai, India, astaghfirullah It was a month and a half ago. But uh, I think it's somewhere on the website. There are means of increasing your Iman. In Iman, as we believe, Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah decreases with sin and increases with good deeds. So to increase your Iman, first of all, you have to do everything that Allah mandated and made obligatory upon you. You have to know Allah, so which means that to increase your Iman, you have to increase the amount of knowledge. Without knowledge, you are just doing rituals without thinking about them. When you read the Quran, MashaAllah, how many juz have you finished? I finish the Quran every one month. MashaAllah, a juz a day? Yes. Do you know the meaning? No. When are you going to start? Allah Kareem. No. It is more important for you to understand the meaning of the verses of Allah, of the Quran, rather than to keep it by heart or to recite it every day. Because the Quran was revealed to be contemplated, to be comprehended, to be understood and applied in our lives. One of the means to increase your Iman is to surround yourself with righteous practicing people. If I surround myself with brothers that only love football, all what we talk about during the day is football. If I surround myself with brothers who only like uh, R&B and rap, all what we talk about is Jay-Z uh, Jay and, and Puffy Dog, the da, da, wh wh whatever the names are. If I surround myself with brothers who are practicing, whenever I sit with them, if I do this, he says, brother, drink with your right, because our Rasul forbade us from drinking the left. Zakallah khair, he gave me an advice. If, I, he doesn't show me, if, if he doesn't see me, Fajr, he calls me in the Dhuhr, brother, I hope you're well. I didn't see you in Fajr prayer. Zakallah khair, next time, tomorrow I'm going to be careful to be in Fajr. They give me advice. Whenever they see me do something wrong, they advise me. They increase my knowledge. At least, if I'm not with them, when they mention my name, they mention my name in good. They don't backbite me. So, surrounding yourself with righteous and good people increases your Iman. Voluntary acts, such as night prayer, a lot of the Muslims don't pray night prayer. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah the Almighty said, and my servant would not get closer to me with deeds 
better than the mandatory deeds or worship that I have mandated upon him. And my servant continues to offer voluntary deeds until I love him. And if I love him, I become his sight that he sees with. I become his hearing that he hears with. I become his hand that he hits with. I become his leg that he walks with. And he continues to get closer to me. And the more he gets closer, I get closer to him. By what? By offering voluntary deeds. And would it be proper for a Muslim not to pray night prayer? Would it be proper for a Muslim not to offer witr? Say, Sheikh, I'm happy. I pray five times a day. Once in the masjid and four, I delay them at the end of the night, but I pray five times a day. This is not a proper practicing Muslim. A proper practicing Muslim has a portion of the night where he's alone with Allah. Nobody's watching you. Nobody's looking at you. But you're praying to whom? To Allah Azza wa Jal. And that is why when you say Allahu Akbar, you feel that the whole world is in your hand. And that's why in the Fatiha, when you say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Allah says, my servant has praised me. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, my servant has complimented me. Maliki Yawm din my servant has glorified me. Allah is talking to you. When you. Do you feel this when you say Al-Fatiha? No, I just want the Imam to finish. <laughs> if he says Alif Lam Mim, I say, holy. <laughs> He's going to take ages now. And I'm going to think, okay, it's going to take 15 minutes. Then we have to go and pick some of my friends and go to the stadium. May Allah make it easy. But when he says, Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falak, all right, you're my man. <laughs> Keep on doing the, the, the good thing. So you have to see why is it that my iman is down? Why is it that I don't know, I can't find any feeling and a nice taste to prayer? Because I am away from Allah ages and, 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 and hundreds of light years away. How to get closer? Increase your iman, inshallah, and Allah knows best. I pray to Allah the Almighty in this blessed night. Not because it's New Year's Eve. It's blessed night because Allah has favored us in making us join and, and, and come in this blessed masjid. I pray to Allah with his beautiful names and beautiful attributes that he make us all go to Mecca and to Medina to offer Umrah and to offer Hajj and to have the honor of, kiss, of kissing the black stone. Now, if the brother has the means to go, I definitely advise him to go. It erases your sins, man. If you have sins, the Prophet says, the Umrah. To the following Umrah, erases the sins in between them. It's all, all because of him. Okay, so if you have the financial means, go ahead, brother. And Hajj is once in your lifetime. If you're young, go ahead now because every time you postpone it, you have more responsibilities. So you, you're 17, 18, you have money, say next year, inshallah. The money that you have, mm, I'm going to buy a car. So next year, inshallah, you buy a car, mm, I have to go to the university. Now they, it's 9,000 pounds a year. <laughs> MashaAllah, tabarakallah. May Allah Azza wa Jal help you in this country. Uh, later on, I want to get married. Later on, I um, have a mortgage. Subhanallah. I, and it never ends. And you find the guy is 85 years old. Next year, inshallah. What is this? <laughs> he's 85 years and still he's hoping and wishing to live. What kind of life is this, my brother? No. As long as you have the financial means, go. If you don't, it is enough to wish it by your heart. Imagine this beautiful religion of ours. I don't have money. But I want to go to Umrah or to Hajj, Allah will give you the reward while you're here without leaving this country and Allah knows best. Poetry and singing, the ruling on poetry and singing, the poetry as stated by uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him and with his father, the cousin of the Prophet, he said, good poetry is good, bad poetry is bad. So saying poetry is permissible in Islam, providing that the lyrics, the meaning is good. Singing, if you mean with uh, uh, the company of musical instruments, this is haram. It's haram in three, three locations mentioned in uh, uh, the Quran, as in verse 64, Surah Al-Isra, in Surah Luqman, and in the end of Surah Al-Najm. And also it is mentioned in the authentic hadith 
in Sahih al-Bukhari where the Prophet ﷺ said that there will be people of my ummah making haram things halal such as fornication, wearing of uh, silk uh, and drinking intoxicants and ma'azif, musical instruments and this was also uh, mentioned in uh, Sunan Abi Dawood and the authentic hadith as well. As for the consensus of scholars, the four schools of thought and I, none of us is out of these four schools of thought. You're either Hanafi or Maliki or Shafi'i or Hanbali. And, and, and they all agree that it is forbidden musical instruments. But singing, as in Nasheed, this is permissible, providing that the words are okay, providing that you're not imitating the kuffar in their way, and you're not imitating the bad singers, Muslim singers, in their way and uh, uh, that it does not occupy all of your time. Some of the brothers do not listen to music, alhamdulillah, but 24 hours, they are with Mashari al-Afasi, Ahmed Bukhatir, and uh, Zain Bika. These are the older three I know, I, maybe there are more. And all the time, they're listening to it. It hardens the heart, and it, if not, kill it. So, yes, listen to it like half an hour a week, an hour a week, but every single day, full time, this is not part of the Sunnah, Allah knows best. I doubt that the, the, the local masjid, that the masjid has a shop inside. Maybe it is within the fence, but nobody prays around it or in it. Because this is not permissible to sell and, and buy in the masjid itself. So if we have a corner here, this is haram to have a masjid, uh, to have a shop here in the masjid. But Outside, if it's outside the, the, the fence and it's considered to be part of the message, it is halal, inshallah, and Allah knows best. No, more, mortgage in the same. What is the meaning of mortgage in Arabic? No, no, not mortgage in, in Arabic. It, what is it called? That word, do you know it? No, riba is different. Correct me, uh, Sheikh, if I'm wrong, Sheikh Muhammad. Correct me if, wrong, if I'm wrong. Mortgage is rahin, wala la? Rahin in, in Islam is to authenticate a debt with a property or with something. This is a, a transaction in Islam. So, for example, if I want to borrow from you a thousand quid and you say, okay, this is a thousand quid, interest free. But what will you give me as mortgage? As something to authenticate. So, in case that you don't pay me in a month's time as you promise. So, I give you my watch, which is usually more than the thousand. It's 1500 for example. So this is mortgage in Islam. Now, this is halal because it is interest free and it is only to authenticate your right. Now what people here consider to be mortgage is to buy a house in installments and the house which is bought, there are complex interest. Meaning that within 20 years time you have to pay 1 million pounds. But due to inflation, this 1 million can be 1.2, 1.3, depending as we go on. And if you are late, you can reschedule it, but we will add more money to that. This is complete riba and it's completely forbidden. This is exactly like, like when they re rename liquor and they call it spiritual drinks. It's called spirits. And when they talk and camouflage prostitution and they call it escort girls. And when they camouflage haram things and they call it art. All of these are names. Names do not change the actual uh, uh, thing. The haram is haram. So even if they call it handling fees, as long as it's interest over the loan, I'm l borrowing money from you and you're taking interest on top of that, this is haram. And Allah knows best. Yes, the question is, what about what's the ruling on uh, wearing change and, and earrings? This is halal for women. <laughs> it felt like somebody's gonna beat me. See, brothers, brothers, but now, nowadays, nowadays, I am, as a Muslim, I have my identity. I go up, I don't come down. When I wear these shackles and, uh, uh, you know, be cool and doing this, and when I walk, I walk like a gorilla, my hands reach my knees. <laughs> and I think that I'm cool. No, I'm not cool. I am imitating a kafir. 
Am I a kafir? I'm Muslim. I'm proud to be a Muslim. Wearing these shackles and wearing these uh, necklaces and bracelets or an earring. It's, I've seen Muslims wearing cross. What is this? Well, I, I've seen somebody. It's cool. It's cool. I don't believe in it. It's cool. It looks nice. Subhanallah. So people go down the slope of following the kuffar until they become like them. It is completely forbidden for a Muslim to wear in, in, in Saudi. We find some Muslims who they have their scholar, the great shaitan. Their, their mufti is shaitan. And you find them wearing these necklaces, but they're silver. So why? It's says, gold haram. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. He's not wearing it gold because it's haram, but he's wearing it in silver. Why? Because silver is okay for men. It is haram for a Muslim to imitate the kuffar in what only the kuffar wear and to imitate the women in what the women wear. And the Prophet said, والسلام, may the curse of Allah fall on the women who imitate men and on men who imitate women. And Allah knows best.